Hi. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is. And as always, happy whatever day it is you're watching this. Welcome to edition 39 of Left Side of the Aisle. This is for the week of uh, January 12th through the 18th, 2012. Uh, and I'm your host. My name is Larry Erickson. And for the next half hour, I'm going to be your ranter and raconteur, talking about things that are of importance to me and that I think deserve your attention. As always, if you have any reactions to the show, uh, you can contact me directly. My email address is whoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G, at AOL.com. Uh, and if you miss that, my website, which is Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, will be up here somewhere in there a couple of times during the show. And you can go there and get the uh, email address directly from there. The one request I make is that if you do email me, please say something like your show or left side of the aisle or something like that in the uh, subject line so that I know this is not spam. All right, this is yet another week that I wish I had an hour, but I don't. So I'm going to try to cover what I can couple of things actually on the top of the list here. The first one is that there actually was some good economic news of late. Unemployment in December was down to 8.5% from 8.7% in November. Uh, and the economy actually added some 200,000 new jobs. It is, on the other hand, a measure of the state we're in when un an unemployment rate of 8.5% is the good news. Uh, and by the way, in addition to those 200,000 new jobs, there are about 50,000 people who left the labor force. Um, that is, people just gave up trying to find work. So about one-fifth of that decline uh, was not as the result of new jobs. It was the result of people getting so discouraged at being out of work for so long that they said so long to the whole idea. Still, a decline in unemployment is good news. Everybody agrees it's good news. I just wish some folks weren't acting like, I don't know, we've reached nirvana or something. Uh, you know, oh, the economy's on the men, unemployment's down, we're on the upswing, everything's great. And of course, with the liberal contingent adding the phrase, praise the great Obama. Um, but yeah, okay, it's good news. I mean, any decline in unemployment is good news. It is. The problem is it's not good enough. The economy would have to add somewhere between 300,000 and 400,000 jobs a month, month after month, to get unemployment down significantly. Um, in fact, uh, the economy has to add about 150,000 jobs a month just to keep up with population growth. Um, and, and the other thing is that new job openings are still pretty scarce. There are about four and a half job seekers for every job opening. That is, there's four and a half times as many people unemployed as there are, peop as there are job openings for them to get. Between 1951 and 2007, over that entire span, that ratio never reached as high as three to one. In fact, only a couple of times did it peak above two to one. Now it has been above three to one every month since September 2008. It's now below its peak, but it's still historically high. And don't expect it to get a lot better. A recent survey of something over 3,000 uh, human, um, human resource and hiring professionals uh, said that only about a quarter of them actually expect to add new permanent hirees in 2012. Uh, that's, the, that's fact one. Fact two is that the number of jobs is not the only issue here. The types of jobs is as well. Uh, over 40% of the jobs added in the last two years have been in some of the lowest paying sectors of the economy, things like retail and uh, hospitality. Right now, something around 9 million people are in jobs that even working full time year round pay no more than about $20,000 a year. All this is part of the reason why data from the Census Bureau, which the, the Bureau recently released, shows that half, nearly half, of all Americans are either living in poverty or are low income. Low income being defined as making, making less than 200%, that is double poverty income. This would be even worse were it not for programs like food stamps and other forms of public assistance. 
That is exactly the kind of programs that have been cut and cut again because we have to reduce the deficit. We have to economize. Or to put more bluntly, we have to screw the poor and middle class in order to protect the stock portfolios of the rich and the profits of the corporations. And at the same time, in fact, we're not only supposed to protect them, we're supposed to feel sorry for how tough they have it. Uh, here's an example. Just this past month, there was this furrowed brow um, report that in October, the Standard & Poor's 500 companies, like 500 of the biggest companies in the country, were projecting that their fourth quarter earnings would be up 15% over a year before. Now it turns out they're thinking that they'll only be up a little over 10% over last year. And this, it said, underscored worries about the prospects for these companies. In other words, we're supposed to be all worried and fretful over the fact that the earnings of these giant corporations went up less than they expected. This at the same time that five and a half million Americans have been out of work for at least six months. Four million families have lost their homes in foreclosures since the recession started, very often due to fraud in the banking industry. Over one and a half million children will be homeless at some point in the year. And mayors of 29 of our largest cities say one in four people who uh, were looking for and deserved emergency food assistance couldn't get it. And all at the same time, of having to hear outfits like the Heritage Foundation spew this kind of crap that uh, if you've got a car, you're too well off to deserve any help. The fact is, Americans, American consumers, we are up against the wall. And as the New York Times put it, we're running out of tricks. I've said it before. I will say it again and again and again and again and again. If you want to get the economy moving, what you have to do is stimulate consumer spending. That is, you have to stimulate demand. And because consumer spending makes up 70% of the economy. So you have to stimulate demand. And the only agency that can effectively create demand is government. It can do it by direct hiring of people to do public works and other needed jobs, uh, giving them a paycheck they can then spend on things that they need. And it can do it by programs like food stamps uh, and other forms of public assistance. That is, they can do it by income redistribution. They can do it by taking money from people who have it, don't need it, and don't spend it, and giving it to people who don't have it, do need it, and will spend it on the things that they need. And you'll be heard about, oh, that's your, you, you, what you want to do is soak the rich. <laughs> Damn straight I do. I want to soak the people who have gotten richer and fatter over the last several decades, while the poorest among us have lost ground, are worse off, and the middle class has gone essentially nowhere. That would mean things like significant tax hikes, uh, hikes on the rich and on corporations for the avowed purpose of transferring that money to the people who actually need it. It would mean public jobs programs. It would mean food stamps, extended unemployment benefits. It would mean welfare. It would mean a significant rise in the minimum wage. In fact, if the minimum wage today had the same buying power that it did in 1968 over 40 years ago, it would be $10 an hour, not $7.25. Oh, and by the way, it's not true that most minimum wage workers are teenagers. In fact, only about a fifth of them are. Beyond that, this would mean things like income support. It would mean public nonprofit banks. It would mean worker and community owned businesses. It would mean labor rights. It would mean a national health care system. So, what you'll hear on that is that, well, that's class warfare. Yes, it is. And it's about time. We have been the targets of a class warfare by the rich and the corporations against the rest of us for decades now. And it's long past time we fought back. All right, I'm going to move on from there to uh, our weekly feature, The Outrage of the Week. This case involves Jamie Gonzalez. He's an eighth grade student in Brownsville, Texas, and he was shot and killed by police on January 4th. He was holding a gun, which later proved to be a pellet gun, and he refused, and I love this description, one source said he refused requests that he put the gun down. Another said he refused when he was asked to put the gun down, 
and yeah, I can just see this. Excuse me, son, uh, if, I, uh, if I'm not interrupting you, would you do me a favor, pretty please? No. I mean, you know full what this was. This was, put it down, put it down, put it down. Now, ultimately, the two cops who answered the 9-11 call from the school where this took place, uh, they shot three times. They hit him twice, once in the stomach and once in the back of the head. Now, you need to know, I am not judging the cops here. That's not what this is about. Uh, the gun supposedly looked real, and the photo I saw of it, it did look real. They may have felt genuinely threatened. Uh, and in fact, on the emergency, uh, on, on the recording of the 9-11 call, you can hear them in the background several times uh, demanding that he put the gun down before they fired. I mean, I think there are still several questions, like, for example, how did he come to get hit in the back of the head? Um, and how real was the threat? I mean, was the gun pointed at them? Was, it, was he just holding it so the, so the barrel was pointed straight down? Did he take what cops call an aggressive stance? But still, I'm not judging the cops. They may, they may in fact, have been entirely justified. Um, what I am going to say is that this is more evidence that tasers should be banned. I'm sure you've heard of tasers. These are these devices that shoot out wires with darts attached to give an electric shock to a person that uh, is intended to, to incapacitate them for several seconds, giving the cops time enough to secure them. Um, there's been a good deal of controversy about their use. The manufacturer insists that they're safe, but uh, there actually have been literally hundreds of people who have died after being tasered. But tasers weren't used here, so why am I saying this is evidence they should be banned? because they weren't used. This is exactly the sort of situation tasers were supposedly designed for, exactly the sort of situation they were supposedly intended for. I mean, they were originally argued, they were marketed and sold originally as alternatives to lethal force. Instead, we get a dead 15-year-old kid. Eight years ago, I wrote this, I'm quoting myself here. With the increasing availability of tasers, especially combined with the repeated assurances that they are safe and even humane, will come increasing temptation to use them routinely, no longer in lieu of lethal force, but in lieu of persuasion and patience, no longer against someone posing a physical threat, but against someone giving a hard time, no longer for protection, but for dominance, no longer, that is, in lieu of lethal force, but in lieu of any force. The intervening years have proved the accuracy of that prediction. There are literally volumes of cases where police have used tasers too and that like lawyer tester euphemistic parlance police use. They've used tasers to obtain compliance rather than using them as a means to avoid having to kill somebody. In fact, in commenting on the story, one person who identified themselves as a cop and the public, interestingly, as sheep, said that um, we don't use tasers against folks with guns. We use deadly force against deadly force as per our training. And so there, and as the case of Jamie Gonzalez really appears to indicate, not only are tasers being used where they were not intended to be, they are not being used where they were intended to be. Ban them now. Tasers, the outrage of the week, or in fact, any other week. All right, moving on from there to something that I would not forgive myself if I did not cover this week. Wednesday, January 11th, was the 10th anniversary of an event which, if freedom survives in this country, will someday come to be known as another day that lives in infamy. January 11th, 2002, 10 years ago, was the day the Guantanamo Bay prison camp opened. Guantanamo Bay, Gitmo as it came to be called, a place in which you could be thrown based on nothing more than a suspicion, a rumor, um, a claim by a disgruntled neighbor that you were a terrorist, a place where you could be caged, abused, and even tortured without recourse. This was created, it was designed to be a legal black hole. And Guantanamo Bay sent our very concept of political freedom and individual rights into a tailspin from which they've yet to recover. How much of a black hole? For some time, the Bush administration refused to even say how many people were there. 
What's more, the White House insisted that those imprisoned at Gitmo had no rights at all, not just no constitutional rights, no rights at all. They said the U.S. legal and constitutional rights didn't apply uh, because this was war. and These people were taken on the battlefield outside the U.S., and they are still outside the U.S., even though they were on a U.S. military base, and therefore beyond the reach of U.S. courts. At the same time, they also said that the Geneva Conventions do not apply to these people because they are not regular uniformed soldiers. They are illegal enemy combatants. Now, this was a term invented by the White House. It has no legal standing. They invented it as a way to justify keep, keep, keeping people in prison indefinitely, without charge, without even a, a more than the most rudimentary, rudimentary hearing which means actually without the need for any evidence. In September 2006, Congress approved this stuff. They authorized the Military Commissions Act, which not only authorized detention of accused terrorist suspects without trial or charge, it explicitly denied all people at Guantanamo Bay habeas corpus rights. Now, habeas corpus, you probably know about this. This is the ancient right of people to demand the state prove that they are being held according to the law. It's a principle that extends back in English common law to the 12th century. It's enshrined in the first article of the Constitution. In fact, you want to know the weight the framers put on this? It is one of the very few rights that are specifically protected in the Constitution before the adoption of the Bill of Rights. Over 40 years ago, the Supreme Court called habeas corpus, I'm quoting here, the fundamental instrument for safeguarding individual freedom against arbitrary and lawless state action. And Congress deliberately, overtly, consciously denied this basic fundamental human right to people in prison at Gitmo. In 2008, in a suit filed on behalf of a Gitmo, Gitmo prisoner named Lakhtar Boumedier, uh, the Supreme Court resulted, ruled that was unconstitutional and that prisoners at Gitmo did have the rights of a habeas hearing. Boumoudien uh, had been kidnapped, he had been tied up and flown to Gitmo where he was held for seven years without trial or charge. And when he finally got his habeas hearing as a result of this decision, he was released because the government could not produce any evidence against him. After the Supreme Court's decision in the case Medien v. Bush, as it came to be known, dozens of Gitmo detainees had habeas hearings, and somewhere between two-thirds and three-quarters of them were released as a result because the government could not produce any credible evidence against them. That shouldn't surprise us, in fact. It's been known for some time that most of the people sent to Gitmo, in fact, were not captured by U.S. forces or by Allied forces on any battlefield. Rather, they were turned over by Afghan and Pakistani warlords looking to, to collect the $5,000 a head um, bounty that the U.S. put on terrorists, an amount more than sufficient, as events clearly proved, to produce more than a good deal of lying. Despite that victory for Gitmo prisoners, indefinite detention without charge is still a standard part of U.S. And US policy. The Obama administration, in fact, has succeeded in convincing the courts that uh, the protections to those at Gitmo do not extend to those held at Bagram in Afghanistan. Prisoners there have not only been, uh, been detained, they've been tortured, they've been abused, and in at least one case, beaten to death. There are now something like 3,000 prisoners at Bagram. They are held beyond the reach of any court, any law, any human rights protection at all. And now, the culmination of all this, we have the National Defense Authorization Act, signed into law on, on December 31st. Um, I've talked about this before. This law authorizes the seizure of anyone, anywhere, including American citizens on American soil, based on nothing more than a claim that they are members of Al-Qaeda or an associated group which, by the way, means that people like clinic bombers and other right-wing terrorists here don't have anything to fear from this. But if you're taken, you can be imprisoned without trial or charge, essentially for as long as the government wants to keep you locked up.
And don't let anyone give you that bull about how this can't happen to Americans on American soil because of some lame provision in the bill that it doesn't change existing law. This has already happened to an American citizen on American soil. His name was Jose, Jose Padilla. He was born in Brooklyn. And he was taken in Chicago in 2002 on suspicion of terrorism charges, held in solitary confinement by the military for three years until a suit filed on his, on his behalf was about to go before the Supreme Court. And there was concern that the court might find this kind of detention unconstitutional. So at that point, at basically the last minute, the Bush administration said, oh no, we're turning him over to civilian authorities, case moot, the decision was never reached. Getting back to Gitmo itself, right now there are 779 prisoners there. Uh, that's the total number that have been sent there over the years. Oh, about 600 of them were released without charges. There were 171 still there today. 89 of those are imprisoned despite having already been cleared for release. Only one of them faces any formal charges. Only six have actually, uh, that's 779, only six have actually been convicted at a military tribunal. 36 more still being held are, are to face charges. 46, I love this, 46 are being held uh, because they're considered too dangerous to release, but they can't be prosecuted. In other words, we know you're guilty, we just can't prove it, so we're holding you anyway. But the thing is, you add all those people up. The six been convicted, the, the 36 to face trial, assume they're guilty. The 46 still being held, assume they're guilty. That leaves you, out of that 779, 691 people. 89% of those sent to Gitmo were sent improperly. They were imprisoned wrongfully. As the so-called war on terrorism continues to serve as justification for expanded government power, expanded executive power, expanded government secrecy, expanded invasion of our privacy, expanding military intrusion into, into domestic civilian law enforcement, expanding strictures on our civil rights. Opening of Gitmo didn't start all this, but it did grease the skids. All right, last thing, last thing of the show today. Um, and another thing, our occasional foray into things not expressly political, and another thing. Why is January 1st New Year's Day? Well, in large part, it has to do with the Roman Senate, a calendar nobody uses anymore, and the persistence and stubbornness of tradition. The earliest recorded New Year was in Mesopotamia about 4,000 years ago. The Babylonians used the first full moon after the vernal equinox to mark the start of the year. And that's a pretty reasonable time. Uh, the vernal equinox, of course, is the, is the first day of, uh, of, winter, uh, of spring, rather, a time for you know, renewals and beginnings and so on. Other ancient cultures used other days. Um, the Egyptians, the Phoenicians, the Persians, they all used the uh, autumnal solstice. I'm sorry, the autumnal equinox, which is the um, first day of fall. And uh, the Greeks used the winter solstice, which is the first day of winter. Um, but the thing is, January 1st has no such significance. It has no astrological, no astronomical significance, no seasonal significance. So why January 1st? Well, the old Roman calendar had March 1st as the first day of the year. Um, which, by the way, also may resolve something that you might have wondered about. Uh, if March is the first month of the year, September is the seventh month of the year, and the Latin for seven is septum. Uh, similarly, for October, November, and December, which were the eighth, ninth, and tenth months of the year, the Latin for eight is octo, for nine is novum, and for ten is decum. But... Um, Again, that, so that's why those months were called that. But uh, according to general agreement, apparently not universal, but general agreement, in 153 BCE, the Roman Senate moved the first day of the year from March 1st to January 1st for administrative convenience. You see, that was the beginning of the civil year, the day when um, newly elected Roman consuls began their term in office. It was also reasonable in another way. Um, January is named for Janus the uh, Roman god of gates, doors, and beginnings. And Janus had two faces, so we could see both the future and the past. 
That Roman calendar, however, was a lunar calendar. It was based on the moon. And after a time, it was seriously out of whack with the solar year. So in 46 BCE, uh, Julius Caesar introduced a new solar-based calendar. And that calendar decreed that January 1st was the first day of the year. However, after the Roman Empire fell and Christianity spread across Europe, there was a lot of uh, determination by the Catholic Church to deter and downplay pagan and unchristian festivals like the ones that had arisen around New Year's in Rome. So in 567, the Council of Tours banned recognition of January 1st as the first day of the year. So across the Middle Ages, across Europe, the first day of the year, what it was, varied from place to place and from time to time. Some places used, for example, December 25th as the first day of the year. That by then was traditionally established as the birthday of Jesus. Some used the old date of March 1st. Some used March 25th, which is the a Feast of the Annunciation and quite conveniently very close to the, to the uh, vernal equinox. And some even used Easter, even though the date of that changed from year to year. But the thing is, by the time the council acted, the date of January 1st was so well established in just among the general public that a lot of people simply ignored the official date and continued to think of January 1st as the first day of the year. Now that Julian calendar was also flawed and by the late 1500s, and again, it was seriously out of whack with the solar year. So in 1582, Pope Gregory XIII oversaw the design of a new, more accurate calendar. This one actually introduced the use of um, leap years to keep the calendar from getting too far out of whack. Interesting, interestingly, it later turned out that the Gregorian calendar, as this is called, slightly overcorrects, which is why century years are leap years only if they're divisible by 400, not four. So 2000 was a leap year, but 1900 wasn't, and 2100 won't be. Uh, Pope Gregory also, by the way, he surrendered to tradition. He reestablished January 1st as the official New Year's Day. Now, uh, Catholic countries in Europe were quick to adopt this, but the Protestant ones did so only gradually because they were afraid that the Antichrist in Rome was trying to trick them into worshiping on the wrong days. Scotland didn't, announce, didn't adopt it for 18 years, and England didn't do it till 1752, 180 years later. So... That's why January 1st is the first day of the year, not due to any special meaning or relevance of the date, but due to the political convenience of the Roman Senate, uh, the Julian calendar almost no one uses anymore, and the surrender of Pope Gregory XIII to tradition. So that's it for this week. I'm going to get out of here. You just have the best week you possibly can, and I will see you next week. Okay? Have a great week.